All right, let's move on to the next part. Uh, this is We wanted to continue to stay on top of this story. Just a quick update here with some pretty extraordinary news. Let's put it up there on the screen. There is now a federal FBI investigation into the Key Bridge crash from Baltimore. So what they are looking at is whether the crew left the port knowing that their vessel had serious system problems. This is after an initial review of the case. Quote, authorities are reviewing the events leading up to the moment when the Singaporean flagship lost power, leaving the port of Baltimore, slamming into one of the bridge's support pillars, collapsing the entire bridge. Just after dawn on Monday, actually, dozens of FBI officials dressed in all black all began storming the ship, where the crew has actually remained since the crash. Quote, pulling up to the ship's bow in numerous boats, climbing aboard using a ladder. The FBI now confirming that the agents are on board and authorities are conducting a, quote, court-approved search. The criminal investigation, which is important here, is being handled by currently the U.S. Attorney Office in Maryland. Same day that, quote, multiple private law firms have separately announced they are being retained to represent the mayor's office and seven of the men who are working construction on the bridge when it collapsed. The signal, an effort to seek accountability and determine what caused the crash that left six of the eight men who were on the bridge that were dead. Now, what's important also is that this came immediately after a report surfaced around the condition of the ship immediately after it left. Let's put it up there, please, on the screen. It says that the bridge collapse had apparent, the ship apparently had electrical issues while it was still docked. Hours before leaving the port, the container ship experienced electrical problems according to those who are official who, officials who were involved in the process that came out the same time that the FBI actually boarded the ship now what they say is that when the dolly the ship departed baltimore early in the morning with its uh with all of its cargo and slammed into the bridge it almost immediately experienced a similar electrical issue so the criminal investigation that will take place here is did they know that the ship was experiencing electrical problems? Were they aware that, or did they cover up either that it happened? Did they put some sort of shoddy fix that ended up shorting the entire ship that eventually led to the collapse and to the crash? So there's going to be a lot of investigation, not just into the crew, but you know, possibly the higher ups yeah. that were involved and telling them, hey, just you need to get out of there. We got to fix this yeah. as soon as possible. That's what I would really Because that, that was the big question I right. had too is, okay, if that all happened and they're hearing these alarms on the refrigerator unit saying, okay, you've got this intermittent power mm -hmm. supply. There's something wrong here. What sort of pressure may the crew have been under to proceed even under those very risky circumstances? Because obviously, I mean, the people that it posed a great risk to as well was themselves yeah. being aboard right. a ship that may not have been seaworthy. And that apparently is the uh, legal uh, standard that they have to meet. So according to the law, you uh, the, the dolly was, you have to indicate whether or not it was reasonably fit for the intended voyage. You may not send a vessel to sea in a known unseaworthy condition. So that'll be the question. I'm sure that'll be you know debated likely in court over whether or not it was in a known unseaworthy condition. And then you know potential accountability flows from there. Uh, something else that our friends over at Lever News have been reporting on is the fact that the um, owner of this ship has been in court trying to limit their liability. Using this 1851 maritime law, it allows them to seek to limit that liability to the value of the vessel's remains after a casualty. So that would mean that their liability would be limited to something like $43.6 million, which, I mean— considering the mm -hmm. damage that was caused and the lives that were lost. This is really peanuts. And that's one of the things that the um, victims' lawyers, the lawyers for the, the families and the uh, one individual who actually survived um, amazingly, incredibly, um, the fall off this bridge, that they're really taking issue with. That One of the lawyers said, imagine telling that to grieving families that while they're planning a funeral, the owner of the boat is in court trying to stop the city, state, and victims from being able to file claims. There was also a detail in this, because I've been wondering, how did that one man survive? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Apparently, he escaped drowning by he was inside of his work truck, and he was able to roll down his vehicle's window and fight through the frigid water. I mean, it was cold that day, and the water is even colder despite being unable to swim 
and then he was able to cling to debris until he was rescued. So survived this huge fall inside of his work truck, is able to swim out through the window in spite of the fact that he can't swim and survive these, um, you know, ice cold waters is really unbelievable miracle that um, that he was able to survive. Yeah, it's an amazing story. And it's one of those where, again, remember, this is one of the worst, you know, industrial accidents here in a long time in the United States. And a criminal investigation, really what it will reveal is uh, what I had seen previously. I remember during the whole Captain Phillips thing, we were reading about why exactly that this kept happening. Mm. And part of the reason is because the shipping companies didn't want to spend money on the extra fuel that it would have cost to go outside of pirate areas. So they're like, it's cheaper to just pay the ransom and to risk it. <laughs> and you're like, wait, what? And apparently that's the thing. You know, you if you're a part of, like, I think if you're a ship captain, you're held within a set amount of fuel that you're allowed to use. You need to call up and you need to get uh, permission from authorities to burn extra fuel because it just costs a ton of money. A certain point, business-wise, I, I do get it. Like I can understand to a certain extent, but sometimes these types of pressures, you know, to save money or to make make deadline and all that, it's going to run up against uh, it's going to run up against safety and it's going to lead to a catastrophic yeah. incident like this. We this, we see this all the time, yeah. like in the mining industry, oh, sure. for example, yeah, mine operators, especially the shadier ones, just skimping on safety at, at you know cutting corners mm -hmm. every step of the way, and you know games that the regular la regulators play to give them a heads up when they're coming to inspect the right. mine. And we've had a number of you know deadly mine accidents because this unscrupulous owner wanted to save money at the risk of their workers' lives. And so we'll see what the details are here, um, you know, what was going on with the, crew, with the crew, what they knew, and what sort of pressure they may have been under from the um, higher-ups. But mm -hmm. we'll certainly... Certainly continue to pay attention to this story because it is so significant in terms of the collapse of this infrastructure and what it means for the entire sort of eastern seaboard going forward. Absolutely. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to BreakingPoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber-funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So, again, to subscribe, it's BreakingPoints.com.